Well, welcome everyone. You didn't know we would make you work so hard for this. <laughs> um, so thank you, thank you for uh, uh, for your understanding and your patience with the uh, the new uh, uh, the new setup, uh, 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 courtesy of the the, uh, the crane removal uh, next door. Uh, we, we do we do appreciate that. Uh, and one of the one of the good things about this is that uh, I was making the welcoming remarks, and so it's easy for me to to <laughs> to reduce uh, uh, to reduce the, uh, that time. Uh, there were there were a couple of things that I wanted to point out. Uh, we're going to have. Um, uh, two uh, session, uh, two uh, speakers back to back this morning, and then there'll be there'll be a coffee break, uh, and then uh, a third speaker. At the end, at the conclusion of the the morning's uh, three uh, lectures, uh, there will be time for Q and A for all of uh, the all three of the speakers. Uh, so, uh, some of you have uh, have cards that, that were at the table down there. If you if you don't, uh, we can uh, we can uh, do that. Uh, we can get those for you. Uh, and um, that way you can write them down and then pass them, uh, pass them along after each lecture uh, and then we can ask the, uh, ask the questions uh, f uh, directly from the cards. Just to make sure that you note on the top of the card which, uh, which speaker um, it's, it's directed at. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was that uh, on the tables downstairs you, uh, you'll see uh, stacks of um, uh, stapled uh, uh, copies that are called uh, founding documents for HABS. Uh, and thank you, Meg. <laughs> uh, founding documents for, for HABS. Um, and um, so these, uh, the pa Peterson papers live at the uh, University of Maryland uh, Special Collections uh, in, in College Park. And I think there are about 300 cubic feet of those. Uh, but in, in there are some of the very earliest uh, documents uh, of the um, uh, of the founding of Habs, including a 12-page manuscript a draft, uh, which uh, th which I've reproduced here, uh, courtesy of the uh, of the University of Maryland, uh, and it shows how quickly uh, and how practically uh, Peterson put the, put this project together, uh, and um, uh, he was thinking in terms of minutia. Uh, how to spread out the number of architects per state and the, uh, the number of teams per state based on population so that federal money was equally distributed uh, and so that uh, California and New York and Pennsylvania got more money than New Mexico uh, uh, based simply on population. Uh, such minutia as to how many pencils would be required. So for a $500,000 program, they, they spent $1,950 on supplies. That was on pencils, erasers, <laughs> and trace paper. Uh, and so the architects who were, uh, who were hired were expected to bring their own scales, uh, their own uh, drawing tables, uh, and, uh, and their own, um, uh, their own uh, contour combs. And we have, a, a, we have an example of, actually we have Charles Peterson's scales in the exhibition case in the, in the gallery. And the, the contour comb that we have down there belonged to Henry Magaziner, who had held the same position that Peterson uh, had uh, at the National Park Service as his historical architect at Independence. So, um, so uh, what I'd like to do is just um, read one quote that I think summarizes uh, uh, the importance uh, of Charles Peterson. Those of us who knew him um, knew that he had a somewhat uh, gruff uh, exterior uh, and, and, and was somewhat prickly around the edges. But the more I study him, the, and uh, I tend to think of him as a very practical man, but uh, he actually waxed philosophical uh, in, in many cases uh, and in a, in a very moving way. Uh, and uh, he, he said shortly after he produced the world's first historic structures report for the Moore House at uh, Yorktown, he said, any architect who undertakes the responsibility of working over a fine old building should feel obligated to prepare a detailed report of his findings for the information uh, of, uh, of those who will come and study it in future years. Such a volume should become part of the building. Uh, a, a payment by the architect for the privilege of, uh, of, of, of learning and using facts that no one else uh, may ever have. And so 
uh, he, I, I, think, I think it's wonderful that he puts it at, as an obligation, you know, so that you have, an, you have an opportunity, you as architects have an opportunity to get in and see things that nobody else has ever seen before and may never see again. And so you have an obligation to the building not just to America, not just to the Library of Congress, not just to the Department of Interior. You, you owe that to that old building. Uh, and, and I think that's a, a wonderful concept uh, uh, that we should all sort of uh, internalize. And uh, so the, the sayings of Chairman Peterson will be uh, sprinkled throughout, uh, throughout today's, uh, today's program. Um, could I borrow the, who has a program? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> To introduce this morning's uh, first speaker, um, Jack uh, Jack Waite. Um, sorry. So, um, Jack Waite was hired by Charles E. Peterson in the 1960s, and he served on five Habs summer uh, teams, two of them as supervisor. And he then worked for the Ford Foundation and the New York State Historical Trust until 1976 when he became a principal in the predecessor firm of John G. Waite Associates, uh, Associate Architects. Um, specializing in historic preservation, uh, JGWA has been responsible for the restoration of many of America's most significant buildings, including five state capitals, Blair House, the president's guest house, Thomas Jefferson's buildings at the University of Virginia, uh, Mount Vernon, the Octagon, New York's Tweed Courthouse, the Lincoln Memorial, the Statue of Liberty, Alexander Hamilton's The Grange, Theodore Roosevelt's Sagamore Hill, and the Cincinnati Union Terminal. I'm tired already, Jack. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming uh, Jack Waite. Thank you, Bruce. I'm very pleased to be here uh, to celebrate the 90th anniversary of the founding of HABS and uh, the 40th anniversary of the Peterson Prize. It's a great event that uh, Bruce has put on uh, with the assistance of Kathy and, uh, and their staffs. HABS, and it's, I always knew it as HABS, uh, and when I worked for the Park Service, it was always called that because they're very proud of their New Deal lineage. Uh, NRA, WPA, uh, PWA, and uh, as I wasn't uh, with the Park Service, but as best I can tell, it was changed to HABs uh, when uh, hookers came in, and uh, <laughs> an aptly named uh, institution that uh, uh, Ford uh, spoke so well about last night. Uh, to us in New York and New England, Habs is a somewhat derogatory name for a National Hockey League team headquartered in Montreal. Uh, um, HABS had a major influence on my uh, professional career and personal life. Uh, Charles Peterson and his uh, team were always very supportive of young architects. Their system was uh, designed to give young architects training in how to deal with historic buildings, beginning with preparing measured drawings, but also learned uh, a lot of other things from my experience there. And uh, that included uh, project management, how to maneuver in a government environment which wasn't always uh, uh, supportive of historic preservation. My first job was at Edison Laboratory at $72 a week. I, I had a much higher paying job for the summer doing fallout shelters in the basement of build, public buildings in New York, but I chose to work on historic buildings. And uh, it didn't get off to a good start because I was promised to work uh, on um, 18th century buildings in the um, 
Virgin Islands, and then that was changed to uh, Savannah. You know, that's okay. A lot of, I knew that there's a lot of good buildings in Savannah. And then finally, when it came through from Pete, uh, I was gonna work in West Orange, New Jersey. <laughs> uh, I thought this might be a good example of government bait and switch, but as it turned out, it was uh, exactly the right move. Uh, later on, I was on two field teams in uh, Maryland and Connecticut, and then I uh, was on two teams, two teams uh, is the HABS headquarters um, in Philadelphia, and there were two of us as student architects. That was the team. Now, we were headquartered in uh, 143 South 3rd Street, the Merchants Exchange. It was uh, basically a building nobody else wanted to be in. And the photograph uh, from the time uh, that I was working there shows it without its cupola. That's because there was a lot of debate about whether this building should even stay because it wasn't here in 1776 and it wasn't here when it was uh, uh, Philadelphia was the capital. Uh, Peterson fought hard to save buildings. This is one of the ones that he, uh, he managed to save. However, uh, uh, Peterson was always getting in trouble with the Park Service for trying to save buildings in St. Louis here. Uh, and he was, uh, had some success. In 1954, uh, uh, Peterson was uh, appointed supervisory architect of historic buildings. At that time, HABS and the uh, historic structures branch were one and the same. And we, uh, even though we're doing HABS work, we might be on the uh, historic structures payroll. And that explains the, uh, my original appointment, which was supposed to be for the Virgin Islands. The funding fell through for that, and what Peterson was a master of is working within the government system. So he devised a way of uh, using capital construction money, which at that time was a lot easier to acquire because of the uh, Mission 6 program, and he would use that for HABS teams. What uh, Peterson did beginning in 1954 is to reinvigorate the uh, HABS program, and it became part of an integrated system, which I think is based on his Navy experience with Admiral Nimitz in World War II. Pete was uh, in charge in Nimitz's headquarters in Honolulu, and he was in charge of building uh, advanced bases as American forces moved uh, westward across the Pacific from island to island. Uh, Peterson's uh, group would go in immediately and build their fields and things like that. So he's, he was really good at juggling things around, not having enough resources, but finding a way to do things. Uh, these are Peterson's notes of summer employees. Uh, from uh, August 1962. And if you go through there, there's a lot of people you'll hear from later. These are summer employees. These are all EODC employees. Most of these people worked on new visitor centers for the Park Service and landscapes. But uh, you go through here and there are people like Blaine Kleiber, Ernest Allen Connolly, Russ Coiney, Harley McKee, John Milner, Blair Reeves, all people you'll hear about later after the National Historic Preservation Act is passed. Now, uh, these are three of the key people at HABS when I worked with there. Peterson, in the middle is James Massey, who is uh, chief of HABS, and on the right is uh, Jack Boucher, who is a long time photographer, and before the creation of the National Register, uh, HABS was the major government agency 
that dealt with historic preservation, especially for non-government buildings. And um, they weren't hesitant to get into lo local preservation battles because uh, a certification of significance by HABS that it was worthy to be recorded or recorded often turned the scales in favor of preservation in local uh, battles. Uh, HABS at that time um, was, as I said, closely allied with the historic structure report. Every morning at coffee break, the architects from Independence Hall visiting firemen and the HABS staff would uh, gather and talk about uh, different uh, things that were happening, not just recording, but uh, preservation on a national basis. And uh, because of its location in Philadelphia, literally in the shadow of uh, Independence Hall, which was then the largest and most important preservation project in the country, uh, HABS was the center of preservation activity. And it was part of a nucleus of uh, other preservation organizations in this area of uh, Philadelphia, including the Society of Architectural Historians National Office, uh, the Philadelphia chapter of the AIA, uh, which was funded by the Crest Foundation to do uh, a survey of all American architectural drawings in private and public collections uh, for buildings built before 1860. Uh, the Athenaeum was often represented there. And a hidden participant was the Ford Foundation because they're the ones who uh, basically got Crest to fund the American Architectural Drawings Project. Um, if you remember the book with Heritage So Rich, uh, that was paid for by the Ford Foundation, who also paid for a delegation of the US Council of Mayors and members of Congress to go to Europe to look at not museums, but uh, preservation of historic buildings used in everyday life. They come back and uh, the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 was the result. The technical direction for that was all hidden, all came from HABS, Jim Massey, John Popier, and, uh, and Charles Peterson. And as I said, uh, the first uh, project I worked on was at West Orange, New Jersey. Now this is really uh, a really uh, great project. This was Glenmont had just been acquired by uh, the Park Service, Thomas Edison's house, but it was a short distance from uh, uh, his laboratories, which were also in Park Service ownership. So we get there. Uh, and uh, we show up in West Orange and we're told that our supervisor from HABS, who's a college professor, wasn't gonna come for two weeks. And so this is another uh, idea that, you know, maybe this is not the right place to be. <laughs> uh, so because of the integration with historic structures uh, branch, Peterson said, uh, go down to the laboratory and report to Gordy Winnington, who was a uh, building restoration specialist for the Park Service. He had just finished the restoration of the tavern on the Natchez Trace Parkway, and he, had, uh, he was at the uh, laboratory because he had a bad termite problem. But uh, this was the best experience because uh, here this guy who was uh, a carpenter all his life, no um, college trainer or anything, explained to us what he wanted us to draw. He was taking apart the building to get at the termite. He was explaining to us how Edison uh, incorporated wood construction into these brick buildings and, and showed us all the problems with, uh, with the termites. Best education you could get to start off is real. So again, Peterson was right. Shouldn't question his... Uh, uh, his decisions. Uh, this is Glenmont when we showed up. 
these are some of the drawings we did. It was a very complicated building. Uh, our supervisor didn't have a lot of experience doing historic buildings. So Blank Library was on this team for me, but we, uh, we got through it. Now, um, fast forward, we, we have a problem with it. This is Glenmont today. Uh, and what we're doing now is making a complete study of Glenmont. Uh, it's water, uh, it's had water leakage problems over the years, and it's had problems with the uh, climate control inside the building. Is there? Anyway, this is, uh, when we were at Glenmont, um, maybe we can put a different thumb drive in. Anyway, when, when we were at Glenmont, the Park Service got another building of the same period that they asked us to go take a look at, and it was uh, on Long Island, and we got out there and it's basically it's, uh, um, it was a suburban house that had been remodeled over time. It turns out that it was uh, uh, Sagamore Hill, Teddy Roosevelt's house. And uh, then decades later, we are brought in to uh, restore the building, beginning with a complete set of measured drawings, which hadn't existed. Uh, this is what it looks like today. And this is what the interior looks like. It's, it's not your typical Nassau County's suburban house anymore. <laughs> uh, these are the field, some of the field team projects. This is Southport, Connecticut. And by this time, the new preservation had caught on. And the idea was that we wouldn't just go do uh, early 19th century houses, but we'd look at the uh, major buildings in the community like this Episcopal Church. And it's on buildings like this that uh, we develop techniques for measuring uh, buildings that were almost inaccessible uh, without photogrammetry or uh, uh, any of the t techniques we have today. We looked at the library. This is the elevation drawing for the library. And then this uh, translated into, uh, was a philosophy that Peterson had for the complete comprehensive treatment of historic buildings, that you just do uh, drawings of the buildings in the condition they are. Don't do any uh, conjectural restoration. And um, find a way to measure a building like this, even though you don't have the tools you should have. And um, with our firm, where we took this uh, into account decades later, are things like the Baltimore Cathedral done by Latrobe. Uh, we had Latrobe's original presentation drawings. We had one working drawing, which is absolutely terrific for the roof. And uh, we had bits and pieces of drawings of later remodelings, but no comprehensive measure drawings. So that was uh, uh, the first uh, matter of business, was to do a good set of measured drawings and then an historic structure report. And And we found out things were constructed in accordance with Latrobe's drawings, and then not so. <laughs> but this is what it's like today, restored back to uh, Latrobe's vision, including furniture and everything. Uh, and measured drawings were made of uh, uh, even the furnishings. We had a similar situation with Thomas Jefferson's rotunda at the University of Virginia which uh, had a, a very complicated history because it burns up in 1895 and is redone by uh, McKinley and White, particularly Stanford White. Then it was renovated in the 
70s, but there was not an accurate set of measured drawings. We had uh, all of Jefferson's drawings, of course, uh, but we had to make a, a, a completely new set of measured drawings. And in doing that, uh, things weren't covered like where the rooms, uh, where these uh, elliptical rooms intersect, there's a lot of masonry. Uh, and what did that mean? We had to um, underpin the building and provide for mechanical space underneath. This is uh, a photograph on the left is it looked during construction, on the right is, uh, is after construction. But one of the things we found in the, uh, it was found by Matt Scheitz here, and he can tell you all about it. Uh, they were looking for ducks in the 1970s, duck space, and so they found uh, where these walls intersected that there's a lot of masonry. So uh, they didn't do adequate research, so they just changed and went away. Uh, what we found was embedded in that wall, and this was where the measured drawings were such an important tool, was uh, the original chemical laboratory from 1826. And they've been bricked in um, in uh, uh, 1840, but it was all intact, including utensils. We had Jefferson's drawings of uh, uh, things like the grates that should be done. So that really showed uh, how important the measured drawings were as a fundamental tool. And then this is the uh, dome room as it is today. Now, when I worked in Philadelphia, we were um, like a preservation SWAT team. If there's a problem with a building that was going to be torn down and they wanted drawings, they sent us out to do it. Uh, one of the things we found, uh, the state of New York is building a new uh, state library building. And in the basement of the old building, they're cleaning it out, they found hundreds of HABS drawings from the uh, 1940s where the architects, when World War II started, just put their pencils down, threw these drawings in a pile, no field notes, and uh, a very valuable collection because many of the buildings uh, didn't survive. So what we did, uh, we started to go through those drawings. I, I don't know whether anybody's ever finished it again, but this is a, uh, a little Dutch church in Sleepy Hollow. Um, it was half finished, but what we had to do was go and see. Uh, in New York, the architects for HABS like to be creative. They're designing new colonial buildings, so oftentimes their HABS drawings showed not what was there, but what they thought should be there, even though it never was. So uh, we had to go through and, and make sure that uh, we weren't uh, uh, continuing a false sense of history. This is a, not a good story. This is Moya Mensing Prison in South Philadelphia, Pasayunk Avenue, a really great complex from the 1830s. It had a criminal prison that was in a Gothic style, and then this was the debtor's wing. And one thing that they always encouraged us when working on, uh, working for HABS or historic structures, is to find out everything you can about the building. You know, just don't go in and measure it, but try to understand uh, why the building was constructed, what building technology it used. So uh, the, this is the debtor's wing. Very interesting structure, uh, and it's a small-scale prison. So this, the whole thing could have easily been saved. It's not like Eastern States that goes on forever. And in doing uh, this uh, uh, emergency recording, we got into the uh, Pennsylvania style of prison architecture versus the New York, which is the Auburn style, what it meant. And turns out that uh, this was more important than even just the basic architectural design. The fundamental planning principles were quite significant. But it was torn down literally as we were finishing up measuring. 
Now, what we, where that information and that approach became very useful is this project. It's a current project in uh, Jefferson City, Missouri. The original building is done by John Haviland, a really good example of the uh, Pennsylvania style of prison architecture. And uh, here there's a proposal to uh, uh, preserve the complex, which has uh, major prison buildings from uh, every period of the uh, 19th century. And this uh, drawing was done by uh, Molly uh, Jordan in our office based on uh, uh, existing drawings. HABS uh, was really at the center of things and one day Robert Vogel came by from the Smithsonian and said, don't you think you've done enough 18th century houses? How about, <laughs> how about doing some uh, uh, industrial buildings? And after a lot of hemming and hawing, it was decided we'd have a, a joint program, HABS, Smithsonian, and American Society of Civil Engineers. And uh, the uh, Smithsonian selected this building, which is in Connecticut. It was a uh, a machine shop that made water wheels, cast iron turbines to power mills, and it was uh, uh, still being run by the second generation of the family that founded it, and it had all its original machinery. Now, when I started with HABS, we used the rag paper from the 30s. That was the worst, especially if you were in a humid climate. Um, so uh, there was a lot of discussion in HABS before this, you know, shouldn't we be using uh, mylar? Well, a lot of reasons you shouldn't because the ink was gonna flake off. Had to talk to DuPont about making special ink with acid in it. And uh, the Smithsonian said, we'll pay for the whole project, but you have to do this on uh, uh, mylar. You know, we can't do this on, on paper. The reason was they wanted us to um, show every piece of machinery and they wanted to show the shafting how, how it was powered and they had a whole narrative which is terrific about how how they made water wheels what the whole process was and uh, you could put one over the other and you could see it now the uh, another uh, case of a building being threatened is we were on a field team in Maryland, paid for by the uh, Maryland Historic Trust, and we came across this firehouse in Baltimore uh, that should, we thought really should be saved. It was a building, it was a firehouse built in 1819 uh, and enlarged in 1858, and it was gonna be torn down. Um, so the Baltimore Sun did a Again, uh, an example of how HABS certification was uh, a reason to save a building. This is the drawing on the right. On the left is the building as it is today. Another building that should have been saved is the Lang Stores. HABS recorded it. Landmark Society, uh, Landmark's Commission, New York, decided that it was going to be saved. It was taken apart and uh, put in storage under the Brooklyn Bridge to be re-erected. What should have been a success story turned out to be a disaster because thieves came in and took this cast iron for scrap. But we were always encouraged to do uh, uh, special projects and based on that building, these are uh, uh, some of the uh, publications I did on uh, iron architecture. Jim Massey was really interested in Frank Furness. He knew I was interested in railroad stations, so we spent Saturdays going across northeast Pennsylvania to look at uh, railroad stations. Uh, he thought this one was by Furness. This later interest turns into the Cincinnati Union Terminal. Uh, these are measured drawings. We had the original drawings, but a new set of measured drawings had to be made. Let me back up. This is what it looks like today. Uh, and this is a publication put out two weeks ago by the Park Service to, for tax credit users. And then just wrap up with two pre 
two current projects using uh, contemporary means of uh, measuring. Uh, New York State Capitol uh, in the 1890s was sliding down the hill, so they built this eastern approach to stop it. It didn't quite work, so it's being completely uh, restored at this point. And this is a uh, 3D model uh, done by people over here who are here today. And then finally, uh, a very challenging measure drawings project. It's built more, uh, had all the original hunt drawings, never had measure drawings done for the building. It was done, uh, measured uh, uh, with laser scanning and a lot of hand measuring. And you see Matt and Porter who are here today doing hand measuring. This is the uh, point cloud board. And uh, these are the drawings. They, they're huge and they're really spectacular, but they're extremely accurate because a lot of the things that make uh, Biltmore important are the mechanical systems, the electrical heating, and they have to be preserved, restored, but made functional. And so the uh, drawings have to be extremely uh, accurate. Okay, and that finishes it. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jack. Um, I've asked uh, uh, Meijing to pass out the cards so that you've got them, uh, and you'll have a supply for uh, for each of the uh, uh, for each of the uh, the lectures today. So don't don't hesitate to fill those out as as we go along. Uh, just in between, uh, more sayings of Chairman Pete. Uh, <laughs> the man who doesn't get his hands dirty will never know enough. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, uh, Amelia Leifesti. Uh, and Amelia is an associate professor for Clemson University's graduate, school, uh, graduate program in historic preservation in Charleston, South Carolina. She's an architect and brings that disciplinary background as well as educational training in sustainable design and historic preservation to the rich medley of faculty in the graduate program. Amelia's research agenda revolves around fostering a sustainable building culture and sees preservation practice as essential to any serious view of sustainability. In research and through her teaching role, she's interested in how we educate practitioners uh, and how a place fosters group identity. She shares with her students the challenge of defining how much and what kind of change can keep buildings useful for current needs without erasing essential touchstones of meaning for people who care about their historic places. And um, Amalia is in the uh, unique position of being both the speaker and the advisor of one of our winning teams this year. So please join me in welcoming uh, uh, Amalia Leifesti. Thank you so much, and hopefully my voice holds for this. I have tested and I am COVID negative, but I have, thank you, daycare, something, something that is going to compromise uh, the power of my voice perhaps a little bit today. Thank you so much for having me here. It is really an honor to get to speak with everyone. And it's also an honor to be here as representing one program, one preservation education approach with colleagues around who are doing fantastic things in their programs. So I'm Amalia Leifesti and I teach with the Graduate Program in Historic Preservation located in Charleston. Um, what we try to center in our curriculum is using Charleston as a laboratory for our graduate students. And our curriculum also centers on having students learn preservation skills through applied hands-on work that also gives back to the community. So people who are taking care of existing buildings, stewards of various places, partner with us. So for many of our classes, not only the ones that I'll talk about today. The premise for this talk is that our graduate students are both users of the HABS collection and also proud of our contributions through dozens of sets over time. This talk will discuss how measured drawing skills are integrated into the required curriculum for our master's and certificate students, and how HABS guidelines and the Peterson Prize competition establish standards for our students' work. 
I'll mostly talk about integrating new technology, namely photogrammetry and laser scanning into the process that students learn and where that gets incorporated into our curriculum. I'll give examples of the sets of drawings produced by our students and discuss some of the themes that have played a role in our selection process over the years, including highlighting threatened heritage and to pick up on what Jack was talking about, the SWAT team approach to some threatened buildings that need um, a record. And also how our long-standing practice and the knowledge of, that our program is part of this tradition of creating measured drawings has opened doors to places that are otherwise outside of access and the public view. I'll end with really briefly three examples of how students are also users of the collection and how the data that's stored in the Habs collection has informed multiple thesis questions. Although I've been with the program for over a decade now, um, I am not the inventor of this curriculum, so I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants when it comes to this as our curriculum model. Ashley Wilson, who was, she is here. <laughs> hope, you, hope you approve of the photo. I found it online, so hopefully it was approved. <laughs> um, but the one of, of uh, up in the corner with her and Carter Hudgens was one from um, our space. Anyway, I inherited this model and have been very, very pleased to carry it on, um, including with wonderful colleagues, Carter Hudgens, um, Jim Ward, Francis Ford, et cetera. So by way of a little bit of introduction to our program, our students come to study historic preservation with a wide range of backgrounds. We get a couple of architects every cohort every year, but primarily we're getting students who come in with backgrounds in architectural history, art history, journalism, and sometimes really unrelated degrees like criminal justice or Norwegian studies, <laughs> which have all proven to be wonderful students, um, but definitely requires a little bit of work to bring everybody up to speed to some of these drawing skills. Part of why I bring this up is because as I was talking with the HAB staff about this presentation, one of the things they mentioned is that our program was one of the earliest programs where to contribute to the Peterson Prize that's coming from a preservation program and not an architecture program. So our students, are learning how to do architectural measure drawings, not usually coming in with that background already. So with a wide range of backgrounds, our first job in the curriculum is to try to create a little bit of a level playing field and instill some early skills in everybody. The first week of the school year is a boot camp called prequel, but sometimes termed hopefully lovingly hell week by the students because it's in August in Charleston, South Carolina, and you need to learn these skills by being out in the field and marching around and doing it. So students do walking tours to learn the history of the city, and they also take on a small measured drawing project by learning how to do plans, elevations, roof plans by looking at a cemetery monument. After that first week, we launch into the curriculum, which is not formatted exactly how I was hoping, but you, mostly what's important for you to know is that there are two main places in the curriculum where measured drawings instruction really comes into play. The first one is a class called Investigation, Documentation, and Conservation, or IDC, and that happens in the first semester that students are with us. And then the second class is called Preservation Studio, and that's a spring semester class following the first. The main thing to know about these classes is that in the fall semester, we teach measure drawing primarily through hand measuring. And then in the spring semester, we do a project. We put it on a treadmill, speed it up, and have students learn um, laser scanning and or photogrammetry, sometimes both. The class called IDC, again, is not purely my invention. This is something that I worked on, um, that I inherited, and then worked on with Carter Hudgens. There's a longer article published in Preservation Education and Research if you want to hear or read more about the pedagogy behind the class. But since I'm not giving any homework assignments today, I'll give you the cliff notes, which is to let you know that this is a class that's set up a little bit like a lecture plus a lab. Um, in the lecture, students are learning about the history of building construction and various techniques about um, how buildings went together. And then in the lab portion, they're out in the field for one whole day each week, Friday, um, and the students basically stay with the same building and the faculty members rotate in to give them different perspectives 
disciplinary perspectives within preservation about that building. So I work with the students on measured drawings, and then they get a session, well, a couple of sessions, with Francis Ford, who's our material conservator, to look at either paint analysis or stone conservation. <clears throat> and then um, they also do some landscape analysis. Most of the imagery on here is from St. James Goose Creek, which is the project that I encourage you to talk to our current students who are in the audience about if you want to know more. As we do these, um, as we do the field recording, you'll we use guides that are familiar to everyone. Um, these are some things that students have as required reading and that are really instrumental <clears throat> in bringing everybody's work into alignment and matching. Sorry, just a second, I'm gonna do this. <coughs> At the end of the semester long class, um, students produce this large comprehensive report that goes to the faculty, um, not the faculty members, that goes to the building owners or stewards of the building that gives a lot of information that the students have put together. So this report, as you might be able to read in the table of contents, includes major sections like the measure drawings and paint analysis. There's also landscape analysis are the three, and building investigation are the four kind of major components. Students also use the skills that they're learning in other classes to create a history and an evaluation of significance section. So these usually 100, 150 page reports are put together by the students and the students also do a final presentation. It really keeps the caliber of work very high to know that this is something that goes out into the world and is useful and used. To take the product from IDC, that class that's done in the first fall semester, and turn that into Peterson Prize competition, there's usually an extra level of translation coordination among the different student teams and laying that out. And so that tends to happen after the drawings have sort of laid fallow for a year, if you will, and the two TAs from the class, from the class who have just graduated, polish and submit for a Peterson Prize. I happened to pick the same one of the two photos. We talked about which photo would be selected to go up on the wall. It's not the student's favorite, but it's, but it's my favorite, the rare dose. <laughs> okay, so that takes us to a little bit of a breather because now you have the background about how HABS enters our curriculum, et cetera, and now I get to talk about projects. So here's a comprehensive list of the projects we've done since 2012. The list goes on, like I said, before me. Unless you're a super connoisseur of Charleston, this list probably means very little to you but I'm gonna use it to let you know about the projects that I'll talk about. I'm gonna talk about two different projects that were critical to record because of um, they were about to undergo really significant change. So Quarters J on North Charleston's historic Navy Yard is the first one. Jackson Street Cottages is the second one. I'm gonna talk about the case study of Mount Zion AME Church, which is an interesting project, but most of the lessons learned from this are about trying to teach documentation and recording during COVID. Not fun. Spoiler, not fun. <laughs> and then to talk about one project that is really the result of the fact that we've built up an amazing arsenal and reputation for doing this work and that it's opened doors for us um, that would otherwise not be, would keep things, would keep historic resources out of the public view. Hopefully this list also demonstrates that our faculty is really interested in students learning about high style and vernacular buildings. Most of the examples happen to be weighted towards the vernacular buildings, but there is a mixture in what we do. Okay. And checking in on my time, fine, just fine. So quarters J, this is in the student's wor words from the report. Quarters J is both regionally and nationally significant. The significance stems from its association with major patterns of American history, as well as significant historical figures. The foremost architectural figure associated with the naval base is arguably that of nationally recognized landscape architect, John Charles Olmsted. Wax eloquent about him. Fast forward, 
In the run-up to World War, the First World War, the Navy base became the largest shipyard in the United States. This included the development of the officers' quarters, including Quarters J. The building which ultimately became Quarters J was originally built as a schoolhouse in 1917. This function evidences that during this time, the Navy took care of the needs of Navy workers and their families who lived and worked on the somewhat remote complex. The building's use shifted to that of Navy, Navy Admiral Housing in 1934. Our program took this project on in part because of the significance of the building like you just heard about, and largely because the Navy Base Redevelopment Authority had imminent plans to rehab the building. With this building outside of the Board of Architectural Review jurisdiction, it was gonna receive a really different level of scrutiny than many of the similarly historic buildings or similarly significant buildings in the Charleston area. And so we were invited in to take on this project as a sort of mitigation for the change that was inevitably coming. Like all the buildings that we select, this building was really interesting in terms of having multiple campaigns of building. Um, and also a lot of historic fabric. So we could do a lot of um, teaching students how to read buildings as they were drawing. One of my favorite anecdotes from teaching and especially some of the rationale for why we teach hand measuring first comes from this building. So we normally divide students up either into small groups or assign individual students rooms. And then I give some instruction and then students get to work measuring and drawing while TAs and I circulate and try to answer questions and help. I got questions, I got called over by a student who said, Amalia, I have measured this wall four times. It is so much thicker than all the other walls in this room. Can you help me know what I'm doing wrong? And it was this wonderful moment because I was like, I know exactly what's going on, but it was so fun to get to walk her through in this sort of Socratic method of saying, okay, let's see how you're measuring. Nope, that's right. This wall is thicker than this wall. What could that mean? And it was guiding her through the process of realizing that that had originally been an exterior wall and that she was identifying different building campaigns from the simple act of understanding that wall thickness was different in these different parts. It was also really fun when she wanted to call her whole class together and help explain her discovery. So this is the building as we saw it in 2016, and then as I did some drive-by photos on Wednesday. Um, and I'm happy to report that the rehabilitation did take advantage or did make use of our list of character-defining features that was in the report, et cetera. And so although changed and altered, it's a fairly sensitive rehabilitation, probably actually exceeding what we sort of expected to come out of this project. The next project uh, are the Jackson Street Cottages, and this is a project that we did in the fall of 2015. Again, to give you an introduction in the words of the students from the report, the cottages on Jackson Street are a group of buildings unique to Charleston known as Freedman's Cottages or Charleston Cottages. The label of Freedman Cottage has become controversial, originating in the 1970s as a way to describe small residential structures built for and by emancipated slaves who required housing after the Civil War. The Charleston Cottage is a simplified one-story version of the Charleston single house because of its street-facing gable end and street entrance to a side piazza. In addition, this type has been compared to the shotgun house because of their long, narrow shape and lack of an indoor hallway. The structures are typically two rooms deep and one room wide, with a fireplace located between the two rooms. In some instances, each room has a fireplace. The Jackson Street cottages deviate from this plan by being three rooms deep with a fireplace between the two back rooms. The entrance off of the street to the piazza often has a screen door and typically two doors off of the piazza into the two primary rooms. The piazza essentially serves as a hallway and the piazzas are extremely important spaces in the hierarchy of space of the cottages. Though the group of four buildings on Jackson Street is held up as one of the last and most intact sets of Freedman Cottages on Charleston's Peninsula, these buildings offer one example of how this building type's name doesn't fit the historic narrative of development. Irish immigrants Catherine Tobin and her son George W. Tobin owned the property beginning in 1879 and commissioned the construction of the building circa 1890 as rental units. 
These cottages feature timber, brace frame construction, which was unusually late for this time period. In addition to the builders of these houses being white Irish immigrants to Charleston, research in the census record shows that the first residents of these buildings, which you cannot read but are tiny in the chart up to the right, um, showed that the demographics of residents varied over time and complicates the Friedman narrative of the buildings. The houses continued to be used as rental property throughout the 20th century, mainly for low-income families. And as the demographics shifted in the east side neighborhood of Charleston, the buildings for the majority of their history have housed African-American Charlestonians and have developed significance from these layers of history. Our program took this project on yeah, I want to be on this side. Our program took this project on as something of an urgent <coughs> mitigation situation. A developer had acquired these four properties as well as the large parcel adjacent to them and was planning to do a zoning maximizing building on the large vacant lot. And as part of sort of penance for that work <laughs> or to generate public goodwill, they were also going to rehabilitate um, the cottages which was a little bit nerve-wracking for those of us who cared about these buildings and wanted to know that they were going to be treated well or at least have a record beforehand. And so we actually had a different project slated for fall of 2015, but when word came in that these were about to um, uh, undergo this big change, we shifted things around and invited um, and, and spoke with the project that we pushed back by a year. The conditions weren't ideal. Uh, for student learning. Um, I think we've many, many of us have probably been in projects that were a little bit harrowing in terms of conditions. Um, and it partly meant me going through and doing wasp spray and sweeping for needles each um, week before students came on site. But it also meant that there were a lot of buildings that we couldn't just couldn't safely go inside. So the drawings didn't end up being the most compelling of sets we've ever done, but it was a really important project to have a record of um, before the renovation took place. There were also fun trickle-down connections that were made from this, such as one of the students who worked on this project was hired by the developer to be the historian for their firm and, was, and authored this article that then a student working at a SHPO office forwarded me to talk about this being held up as a tax credit property win. Mount Zion Amy Church um, is built between 1847 and 1848, uh, and it was originally constructed as the Glebe Street Presbyterian Church. The building design is attributed to Francis D. Lee and Edward C. Jones. Francis D. Lee was completing his graduate degree at College of Charleston and was serving as an apprentice for Edward C. Jones, an African-American architect who led the church's construction as his first major commission. The property, which is approximately 3.4 acres, is located at 5 Glebe Street and was acquired by a congregation composed of former members of the then overcrowded Mother Emanuel AME Church. Although this place warranted the full preservation treatment, the full documentation treatment, um, all of these things that you see here were not possible in the fall of 2020, given the global pandemic situation. And so, we weren't allowed to meet with students. We weren't allowed to be in the same space with them. So instead, students got videos showing how I had done a series of laser scans of the building. And then we would meet in virtual Zoom rooms to talk about how to extract measured drawings from these scans. Student computer capacity meant that we couldn't actually send the point clouds. So we were sending ortho photos that were then essentially a tracing exercise. I had two wonderful TAs and we would spend lots of time on Zoom heading, throwing people into breakout rooms and trying to mostly troubleshoot issues like licenses and ability to get ortho photos, et cetera. It led to drawings that students weren't very confident about or that didn't, weren't very confident about the hierarchy. And so very thankfully, um, and in retrospect, since everyone stayed healthy, um, the university changed the policy mid-semester and we were able to meet together on site one time for a single day of field work, um, which was wonderful to watch students who had been trying to decipher and discern what the space was about as their first architectural measure drawing project actually walk into the space for the first time midway through the semester and see it. We also got to meet with Pastor Middleton and hear about the significance and it really changed the energy um, and level of commitment for the class. So you see the drawing on the left, which was 
before the one site visit and the drawing on the right after some heavy handed red lines and then also a single day on site to get to do drawings together. So long story short, we all persevered through uh, something that I hope we never have to recreate in terms of virtual learning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The final example, and I know I've only got a few moments, um, is that our program has the honor of partnering with a family that has a series of um, buildings that are associated with antebellum rice plantation in the Ace Basin. The property owners are extremely private about the property, but because of this longstanding tradition of doing this and some connections and some references, we've managed to work our way into a partnership with them and we are slowly working our way through creating a record of these buildings. Um, Mary's house is a building that's known for its last resident and occupant who lived in this building until 1998 and I We'll tell, I will move quickly through letting you know that the significance of this place is derived from, it's um, one of the most intact groups of buildings associated with um, enslaved workers that exists in South Carolina, in the Low Country, and that several of the experts we've been able to bring in have sort of ever seen. I can't show you all of the fantastic images. Um, so its association or its significance is associated with that first period and then also just the fact that these have been um, inhabited and lived in over time. So like the other IDC projects, we do a series of measured drawings, students do paint analysis or other finish analysis, landscape analysis, and look at the broader patterns of history and the context that it fits into. On this property, we've had the chance to do other classes, including one that looked specifically at the rice barn, which is, again, tying into Jack's lecture, um, partially really interesting because of all the equipment that is remains in this building. And we were able to partner with Habs as an instructor, Dana Lockett as an instructor for this to help students who are getting, at this point, getting pretty good at doing measured drawings of buildings, also learn how to do axonometrics and measured drawings of equipment. Also on the site, we're doing um, finish analysis for some of the houses built for and by enslaved people um, and doing a class completely devoted to the interior finishes of these buildings. So those are all the examples I've got for you today. Pared that down. And the last thing I want to mention is the way that students also draw from the Habs collection. First of all, by building experience doing these drawings, as all of the student scholars with us today know, this becomes a fantastic resume item, um, something that a really great skill set for you to use headed into your career. But I also like these two anecdotes, which was I had an architecture student come to my office earlier this week and ask me how tall are ceilings in Charleston single houses? And instead of spoon feeding him an answer, I said, I need you to know about this collection called the Habs Collection. You can go on there and you can pull out, these are three examples that we have, but you can pull a large set of examples and you can create a little sample set of how tall are interior ceilings in Charleston single houses. Our students have also used the Habs repository to help answer thesis questions. Um, one student was looking at embodied energy of contemporary brick versus historic brick and needed to be able to find some accurate way to calculate the volume of brick being used in various structures. And so the Habs collect, that wasn't something he was going to be able to travel around and measure in the course of a single one year, one academic year thesis. And so the Habs collection was incredibly vital to that. We also had a student who was looking at whether machine learning could help to identify makers of uh, certain carpenters or certain craftsmen, and so he needed a really large set of molding profiles. Um, and so he, again, drew most of his work not through fieldwork, not through his own fieldwork, but through the Habs collection. That is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you so much, Amelia. It's, it's so rewarding to see the production of HABS uh, documentation and the use of HABS documentation by the same group of people to accomplish uh, 
uh, terrific, terrific things. So we're going to take a 15 minute break now. If you have uh, already filled out a card, there is a bo an empty box. Uh, May's holding it up back uh, at the desk there. Just drop uh, your, your filled out cards uh, there and then we'll address that at the, uh, at the end. So we'll meet back here at, at 11, uh, 11 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>